Welcome to another lecture in a series of lectures for the AP Environmental Science Classroom. I'm Mr. Burley and today's topic is water and wastewater treatment. Ask yourself a question and see if you can come up with the answer. Where does your water come from? The drinking water that comes out of your faucet. The water that you bathe and shower with. The water that washes our dishes. The water that takes our waste away. Where does it come from? Very simple question to ask, one that not all of us know the answer to. In our attempt to be to continue to try and gain an appreciation for water, the most basic of human needs, a lot of us don't realize where it comes from. And an even more difficult question for a lot of us would be to ask what resources are needed to manage water? How do we treat the water before we drink it? How do we make sure that we're not going to get sick? How do we make sure our wastewater is cleaned before we let it back out into the environment? Crucial questions to ask and today's lecture is all about those answers. Learning and understanding how we treat our water helps us gain a better appreciation for not only living in a first world country and having these types of facilities and technologies, but also to gain an appreciation for how precious our water actually is and the energy that goes into making sure that it's safe for us to drink. And hopefully you're going to also gain appreciation for how readily available water is in our lives. And that's not true for everyone. So let's begin this discussion on water and wastewater treatment. Where does your water come from? Here in the Souderton area of Pennsylvania, our water comes from the Delaware River. All right, here you go. Here's a Google Earth image of the Delaware River. And I have a couple of icons put up here to kind of help us take this tour of where your water comes from and how it gets to you. So look at the Delaware River, and you notice I have this icon here at New Hope. There's a New Hope pump house that literally pumps Delaware River water over the land to Peace Valley Park, where there's a big giant reservoir. All right, so our water starts its journey somewhere north of us. It trickles down through the Delaware River all the way down here, and it gets pumped via pipeline into Peace Valley Park. So now, as we continue this discussion, think about the Souderton area, the Doylestown area, Quakertown, Lansdale, all growing areas, a very nice place to live in eastern United States. As our area continues to grow, and as population continues to rise, as more and more people move into our area, those people demand more water. There'll be less water downstream of the Delaware River. All of us contribute to the Delaware River getting smaller and smaller. All right, so that's one reason why we should consider our water usage and think about water conservation on a daily basis. All right, we should really appreciate the water that we use and appreciate more so the water that we don't waste. Okay, Because everybody needs the water and there's only one source, the Delaware River. Okay, so let's continue our journey here. It gets pumped to Peace Valley Park. If you've ever been to that park, there's a gigantic reservoir, and that water sits there, and it adds to the biodiversity of the area. But from there, after a time in storage, it gets pumped down to around Route 309, where Zodo's Restaurant is, where there's another pump house, which pumps it up to just off Route 309. There's a water tower owned by the North Penn Water Authority, and it's just off 309 across from the Fretz Music Store, if you know where the Fretz Music Store is. Across the street there's a water tower in the back and that is the water tower that feeds the whole entire Souderton region. Okay, somewhere along that trek the water is treated from the North Penn Water Authority. It is treated in a water treatment plant and that is where all the magic happens to take Delaware River water from being unsafe to safe. So that's where your water comes from and we don't use all the water. There's actually more that continues on a journey a little bit farther north in between Quakertown and Satterton. There's the Perkyoman Creek. All right, a pipe takes it from the Route 309 corridor and it actually pumps it into the creek where the creek will take that river naturally to the Limerick Power Plant. 
And the Limerick Power Plant actually uses the same water, the Delaware River water, to generate energy and then puts it back out into the environment uh, once it's through. So a lot of uses for this water along our pipeline. Water is so important for all these people, all these people along these lines here. All right, water management and politics are such a huge component of our daily lives. If you think about it, water leads to human health. We need water to remain healthy human beings. Water contributes to food production and food security. We use water domestically and we use it for our sanitation to take our waste away. We use water in our energy generation, like we just talked about, the Limerick Power Plant. And we also use water for ecological services and environmental sustainability. So water is so important in our daily lives. It's just so out of sight and out of mind. And it's easy to take for granted that it's going to be at the tap. You're never outside of a few feet from a water source. Now, the United Nations considers water access as being a half an hour walk to the water source and a half an hour walk back from the water source. That is what it means to have access to water in the world. We have plenty of access to water, but there's over 1.7 billion people who do not. So please consider these ideas and these, these facts and these concepts as we move through here. The Delaware River is one of the most beautiful rivers in the country. However, it has a laundry list of pollution history. If you think about it, ever since the colonists arrived here, there's been rapid population growth and industrialization around this waterway. All the way through from, co from colonial times through the Bethlehem Steel, which popped up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and is over two miles of steel industry along the Lehigh River which dumps into the Delaware River. Over 200 years of pollution history for this river. And we still see evidence of pollution today. We still see waterborne illnesses. We've seen a decrease in migratory fish populations, including the American Shad. The American Shad was used extensively by the Native American populations who used it as a food source. And today it's basically gone. We see dead zones in the Delaware Bay where there's no oxygen from eutrophication and nutrient pollution. All, right, all this along a rich history of the Delaware River. Now, when did things start to change? Things started to change in the year 1961 when an organization was created called the Delaware River Basin Commission. The Delaware River Basin Commission was explicitly created to clean up the river. In 1961, uh, this group began its efforts to clean up the river. And they decided that this organization must adapt and evolve. It needs to lead to new technologies to not only detect and monitor, but to track pollution in, our, in the waterways and in the watershed itself. All right, this group, in all its efforts and all its cleanup, it led to one of the most important, most successful laws in United States history, the Clean Water Act. All right, the Clean Water Act of 1972 further assisted water pollution efforts and cleanup of the Delaware River. And since the Clean Water Act, that law went into effect to not only clean up pollution and our waterways, but also to prevent pollution. Ever since that Clean Water Act, the Delaware River has been cleaned. You can think of the Delaware River as being one of the world's best pollution cleanup success stories. So think about that, and here you go with this law going into effect and really being successful. We'll talk a lot about the Clean Air Act as well, but in 1972, when environmentalism was basically born, the Clean Water Act was one of its leading pieces of litigation. Okay, we're talking about drinking water. How does it get cleaned in its way to our tap. So we take a source of water, all right, and it could be a lake, it could be a reservoir, it could be a river, it can be groundwater. Whatever it is, we're taking water out of nature and we're making it usable. All right, and the first step in getting that water usable is to pump it from its source and immediately add two chemicals to this, the water. And those chemicals are lime and alum. 
All right, lime is used to buffer the pH of the water. Rainwater is naturally acidic, so we don't want to drink acidic water, so we use lime, which is crushed limestone, all right, it's calcium carbonate, as a buffer to buffer the pH of the water. Alum is a little bit different. We use it as what's called a coagulant. All right, a coagulant basically makes particles stick together, coagulation. All right, make something very small, and as they coagulate or knock into each other, it gets to be a little bit bigger of a particle. So along this route, if we send the water through a sedimentation tank, that alum, those particles, will get bigger and bigger, and they'll get heavier and heavier, and they'll naturally just kind of settle out. So in this sedimentation tank, water will just sit there, and the big particles will settle out. So it takes several hours as water goes through here and all the while bigger particles are settling out and those that kind of settles out builds up at the bottom here but in the meantime the water gets clean of all the sediment of any suspended silt or clays or particulates alright so in this sedimentation tank we're filtering out particulates so we get clear water now even though it's clear and it looks clean, it is obviously not clean. In any water there's bacteria, there's organisms, there may even be pathogens. And that's the next step on our journey here in the next tank, all right, our filtration tank. In the filtration tanks, what we're going to do is use sand filters. So we take sand and pebbles. In this tank you can see the sand and pebbles. And what we're going to do is we're going to add good bacteria to the sanded pebbles and mix it in the water. All right, and that good bacteria is going to biologically filter out any very small organisms. Okay, so we need that good bacteria in there and we're using the sand and the pebbles as a vehicle to add those good bacteria. Then we can filter out any organisms, get those out of there, and then just for safe measure we're going to add a bit of chlorine and disinfect the water and just make sure that any of those bacteria or any of those pathogens that got through this is going to be our fail safe and you might think that chlorine is a poison and it is you use it in your swimming pool to kill any algae or any bacteria in your swimming pool um, in this process the chlorination process the water will, will go through a storage tank and it takes a long time to get through this storage tank All right, we're talking about uh, several hours to get through this storage tank and all the while chlorine will actually degas. So we want the chlorine to have enough time in the water to kill the bacteria but we also want to give that water enough time that the, the chlorine can degas before it is actually sent out up into a water tower where it's stored until people begin to use the water and then that's the final step of the process. Hopefully that diagram gives you a nice indication of the process of treating the water before it gets to you. All right, if you have any questions, please bring them to class. Let's take a look at a couple pictures here. Oh, and there's some motion arrows. Okay. All right, here you go. Alum as a coagulant and lime buffers a pH. This is a limestone quarry. I just wanted to show you that these are two natural ingredients. All right, limestone is calcium carbonate, typically uh, huge deposits of previous ocean environments where dead organisms and skeletons of sea critters have piled up in huge deposits and have turned to stone, and that's what limestone is. All right, here you got your coagulation and flocculation tanks. Okay, we're going to add that alum, and we're going to stir the water so that we're enhancing the amount of collisions so that smaller particles become big ones. Those big ones literally settle out as what we call sludge. All right, and then that sludge is disposed of. The water can then move on. All right, and here's one of those settling tanks. That big arm there spins around very slowly to allow the water, any particles in the water, to settle out down here in the bottom. Then if you see the bottom is actually sloped to facilitate that sludge collecting down at the bottom where it can be then pumped out. And the last step before your house are the water towers. A couple reasons to use water towers. All right, we pump the water up 
and we can store large amounts of water above ground. And what we're going to do is we're going to use gravity. When somebody turns on their faucet, say in this house down here, and water needs to be replaced in the system, we can use gravity to replace that water. Instead of pumping water horizontally, we pump it up once, keep it stored up there, and then as people use the water, gravity becomes the energy used to refill the system. Okay, so you'll see all these water towers around town now. You'll start to notice how many of them are in and amongst communities. You'll notice that they have advertisements on them. You'll notice that they have cell phone towers and antennas on them. Just start to notice how many of these things are out there, and this is what they are used for. All right, and here's just for those of you who like definitions, here are the definitions for the, the terms that I've been using. You can pause and take a look at this, write these down in your notes, but those are the processes and the vocabulary for what we just spoke about. All right, please gain an understanding of the amount of infrastructure needed in a first world country to obtain water, manage water, disperse water, and what's actually in our homes. Okay, in the first world here, we have a system of copper pipes. All right, think about that. We're using PVC as well, but copper is still the best way to transport water. Okay, we have lots and lots of valves to be able to turn water off and on to gain access, uh, stop leaks, manage water. We have aeration tanks to help relieve pressure on water systems. So much goes into this so that we can have water on a daily basis. Look at the infrastructure and think about the amount of water we use on a daily basis. In every kitchen there's sinks, there's dishwashers, in bathrooms there's sinks and toilets, um, showers and bathtubs. In your basement you probably have a water heater with access to uh, cold water and warm water. We have washing machines. We have utility sinks. We have water on the outsides of our homes to hook up hoses so that we can water our flower gardens and our gardens. I right, think about, about all that. And somewhere in your house there's a water main that comes from the outside and the water company will put a water meter. All right, Just a little meter that actually measures the amount of water you use on a daily, monthly, and yearly basis and you're charged for that water and it's very inexpensive. Again, we are so lucky to live where we do and we are so lucky to have the access to water that we do. And then there's also an outgoing pipe that goes to your sewer or your septic tank depending on where you live and what systems you have. All right, please try and gain an appreciation for the amount of infrastructure in our homes and that are available to us as first world nation because not everybody has access to water like we do. This picture is in Haiti. It is probably sometime immediately after the earthquake that they suffered, but it just shows the amount of people all needing water and the ways they get it. All right, most of them use buckets or plastic containers. All right, here's a basin. Somebody's doing their laundry or their dishes. All right, right next to the water source, you see people in the water source all using it. And here's a gentleman bathing. And I like this picture because it's somewhat powerful as well. Um, access to water means walking for it. And if you've ever carried water, think about how heavy water is. Think about walking a half an hour to get it and then a half hour back. Here's an individual washing your clothes. Here is the stream. All right, so you see this man walking in the stream. And then look at the sheer amount of people just in the water. All right, we're talking about unsafe, unsanitary conditions. Here's a bit of pollution down here in this picture laying in the water. We are so lucky. Just to put a couple numbers to this, um, one out of five people in the developing world, it's over a billion people, face risk of disease and death due to lack of access water, lack of access to safe drinking water. And here's a nice pie chart. In Africa, almost 40% of people don't have safe drinking water, and almost half have no adequate sanitation. Asia, the numbers are a little bit better, but remember Asia's population is exploding. Over half have no adequate sanitation. All right, a big, big problem around the world. And then I like this too because this is when somewhat shocking. 
This is the amount of water used per day. In Kenya, the whole country of Kenya uses 47 liters of water per day. Whereas just in the city of Phoenix, a desert city, they use 832 liters per day. Okay, so think about that. Here you have a desert city. So what are people using it for? They're not only using it to wash and, and drink, but they're also using it to water their lawns where they feel the need to plant grass in the desert. All right, and wash our cars because it's a dusty place to live. Think about the amount of water used. That doesn't have to be. Okay, so what are some solutions? Here you go. You have two children who deserve access to water. All right, the UN defines water as a basic human right. They believe that everyone should have access to safe drinking water. And I have to agree. I think that that's a basic human right. One solution is called the bio sand filter. And this is a household solution, okay? And the bio sand filter is just that. It's biologically based, and we're going to use sand in here, and we're going to try and filter out any contaminants. So let's say we have a contaminated water source. It can be contaminated with anything. You pour it in, and the first thing that the water encounters is a diffuser plate. And that diffuser plate is put there to basically slow the water flow so that it makes sure to pass through the filter, which looks like this teeth thing here. All right. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that the water slowly percolates through here and just doesn't rush through. But as it passes through the filter, the filter has a biologically active film. All right. So there's bacteria on there that kills most of the pathogens. So we need the water to slowly percolate through that biofilter so that it can do its job. And then at the bottom, we want to filter out any particulates, any foreign objects, any other type of pollution in here. So we put sand through here, so we control the rate of flow using sand, and then a little bit faster through gravel, all right, before pumping it out. And now our water has been cleaned of both pathogens and bacteria, and any particulates, any sands, or anything like that. All right, this is the bio sand filter. Just a more household scale solution to cleaning contaminated water in a developing country. All right, another interesting more household scale solution would be called it is called the life straw. There's a lot of organizations out there that are promoting the life straw and it's basically a a personal filter. All right, and here is how this works very quickly. Um, you're going to drink down at the bottom, the water is going to come out down at the bottom, the water goes in at the top, and the first thing we want to do is filter out any uh, debris or any part particulates. So the first filter, here's a filter, it measures about 100 microns in diameter, very, very, very small filter. All right, this filters out any bigger particles like dirt and sediment. Okay, so when you begin to suck the water through the life straw, uh, you're pulling it through this very fine filter, which will filter out any sediments. All right. The next filter of the life straw uh, is just a little bit smaller in microns, 15 microns, very, very small. And that's going to filter out any of the larger bacterias. Okay, so now we're filtering out the sediment and the particulates, and we're starting to filter out the larger bacteria. And then from there, water is going to move through a chamber of beads, all right, and they have uh, iodine on them. All right, and that iodine kills any parasites and any other bacteria and viruses. So iodine becomes the cleaning agent in the water. So the water will pass through here, and all the while you're sucking it through. The last thing we encounter here is a layer of granulated carbon. And carbon is great for improving the taste of water, the smell, and it also filters out any remaining parasites. So you have four regions of this life straw to filter out any uh, particulates, bacteria, any types of viruses or parasites. All right, and that's the life straw. Another more personal or household solution, nevertheless a solution.